We move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. The engagement is to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Doctors' leaders have warned this week that the NHS will experience pockets of meltdown this winter. Can I ask the First Minister whether she thinks her government is doing enough to maintain appropriate staffing levels in our hospitals? First Minister. Of course, staffing levels in our hospitals have increased uh, dramatically under this government. There are more than 11,000 additional members of staff working in our NHS now than was the case when this government took office. Uh, the government plans intensively for the winter period. Uh, we make sure that our health boards are well resourced and well supported as they plan to deal with the additional man demand that faces the health service uh, during the winter months. Uh, one thing I would say is that as we prepare for those winter months, uh, it is encouraging to know that as of now, our accident and emergency units are the best performing anywhere in the United Kingdom. Yeah. Ms. Davidson. I'd like to thank the First Minister for that reply, but she will know that the system is in trouble. If you take the situation with temporary staff, we were told by medics this summer that hospitals were now having to turn to locums more and more to cover shifts. So we asked every health board in Scotland to say how much this was costing. The figure is £248 million. That is a quarter of a billion pounds spent last year alone on locum doctors and nurses. And that figure is rocketing. It's up by £41 million in just one year. That's all because our hospitals don't have the staff needed to cover the rotas. Does the First Minister think that this is in any way satisfactory? First Minister. Well, health boards will make uh, use of agency staff where that is required to deliver uh, high quality care for patients. We are very clear uh, with health boards that they should minimise the use of agency staff. And of course, we've worked in uh, past years to increase the use of bank NHS staff instead of agency staff. But what we are focused on is making sure that we have working in our NHS record numbers of full-time permanent staff. I mentioned to Ruth Davidson in my last answer the increase we've seen in whole time equivalent staff since the SNP has been in government up by more than 11,000 whole time equivalents in that period. That's one of the reasons why, yes, demand is rising, but notwithstanding uh, that rising demand, we see waiting times today that are much shorter than they were uh, when we took office. And as I also said previously, we're seeing our accident and emergency departments perform much better than any other part of the UK. And that's been the case consistently for a considerable period of time now. So there will always be challenges in our National Health Service. I would be the first to concede that point. Uh, but it is because of the resources we're putting into the National Health Service it's because of the support we give to our health boards, it's because of extra numbers of staff that we are seeing patient satisfaction with our health service also at record levels. Ruth Davison. Thank you. The First Minister won't admit it, but this is in part due to the failure by this SNP government to manage the NHS properly. Four years ago... Four years ago, as Health Secretary, Nicola Sturgeon cut training places for nurses and midwives. At the time, she called it, and I quote, a sensible way forward. The nurses warned that the cut in numbers, and again I quote, risk there not being enough professionally qualified nurses graduating to meet the demand for health services in the future, and this cut will be bad for patient care. The nurses were right, and she was wrong. So let me ask her, Will the First Minister accept personal responsibility for the problems that her decisions have created? First Minister. Presiding officer, the number of qualified nurses and midwives working in our NHS today is up by more than 5% since this government took office. Yes, I am happy to accept personal responsibility for that increase in the number of nurses working in our National Health Service. And just for completeness, we're seeing uh, the number of doctors up 25 per cent, uh, the number of emergency medicine consultants up 184 per cent, uh, geriatric medicine consultants up by 38 per cent, paediatric consultants up by 84 per cent. So there are more people working 
in our NHS uh, today. Uh, Ruth Davidson's mentioned uh, agency nurses. When we took uh, office, there were 728 whole-time equivalent agency nurses working in the NHS. In 2015-16, that was down to 276, a reduction of 61.9%. So, yes, there are challenges in our National Health Service. That is because of the increasing demand coming from an ageing population. That is why we are pledged uh, to record funding for our health service. In the recent Scottish election, it was the SNP that pledged the biggest increase in health funding of any party standing. Uh, we will increase the health budget by £500 million more than the rate of inflation. But we will also reform our health service. Uh, we're transforming primary care, investing more in social care uh, and in community care, and of course expanding elective treatment capacity as well. So investment and reform will ensure that we continue to deliver good results in our health service and continue to see good patient satisfaction as well. Ms Davidson. So now it's all the health board's fault that they have to spend a quarter of a billion pounds on locums because they can't get regular staff. It's always someone else's fault with this First Minister. Yeah. But here's the charge sheet this week. This week alone, we've had a Rural Affairs Secretary apologising again for the mess that they've made of farm payments. We've had an Education Secretary desperate to salvage and name persons but who won't even speak to the people who dare to criticise him. And now we see an NHS which has become so stretched that we're shelling out a quarter of a billion pounds a year on costly locum cover. The First Minister is on the slide because instead of rolling up her sleeves, she's tearing up her promise not to hold a second referendum. So enough of the distractions when she's finally going to get a grip of this failing government. First Minister. Well, of course, the reason Ruth Davidson wants to talk about independence is as a smokescreen for the almighty mess her party has created over the European <laughs> Union. But let me go back. Let me go back to the National Health Service. I see that Ruth Davidson was quite keen to get off the subject of the National Health Service after my last answer. I'm not sure what it is about a 61.9% reduction in the use of agency nurses under this government that Ruth Davidson didn't quite grasp in my last answer. I'm not sure what it was about an increase in uh, all staff in the health service, a 5% increase in the number of qualified nurses and midwives uh, working in the health service. It's those kinds of investments uh, delivering the results we're seeing for patients in our health service uh, that is uh, resulting in record patient satisfaction records. So I recognise there is more work to do, uh, but I think patients would probably prefer this government to continue to build on the success uh, of our health service than have the Tory government uh, in London, who of course has managed to force junior doctors out on strike. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister when she will next meet Sam H. First Minister. The Minister for Mental Health met with Billy Watson, the Chief Executive of Sam H yesterday to discuss our plans for our new mental health strategy and to hear about Sam H's plans and services. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. <clears throat> Today is Wear It Pink Day. And the First Minister and I will leave this chamber and don pink wigs and sunglasses together to highlight the toll that cancer continues to take on families across Scotland. But today's daily record highlights the reality of cancer treatment under this government. Anne McLean Chang is a mother of two and a nurse with 20 years service. She has secondary breast cancer and is very, very seriously ill. Anne wrote to the First Minister pleading for help because she has had to raise £90,000 from strangers to pay for her cancer treatment. I will say that again, presiding officer. In 2016, a woman with breast cancer has to crowdfund her own cancer care. That can't be right. Anne finishes her heartbreaking letter by saying, I don't know where to turn next. Well, I'm turning to the First Minister now. What specific steps will the First Minister take to help Anne get the treatment that she needs? First Minister. Well, uh, can I thank Kezia Dugdale for raising this issue? My heart uh, goes out to Mrs McLean Chang. I have indeed received her letter. 
Uh, the drug in question is not generally approved for use on the National Health Service. I understand that's also uh, the case in England. We have asked the company that manufactures this drug to bring forward a new application at a fair price so that it can hopefully be generally approved. In the meantime, patients can seek to access uh, drugs not generally approved through the individual patient treatment request system. Uh, I understand from Mrs McLean Chang's letter that in this case, such a request was refused. However, I can advise the Chamber that this morning, following further discussions with her clinician, NHS Grand Payne has agreed to fund this drug for Mrs McLean Chang, and I understand she has been informed of that this morning. I hope now we can all wish her well uh, in the future. Officer, there's no doubt that that is wonderful news, and it will come as great comfort to Miss Anne McLean Chang her family and our wider friendship network. But it shouldn't have taken the front page of the Daily Record for that to have happened. And if I can refer the First Minister back to Anne McLean's letter to the First Minister, in that letter she says, I am not the only patient who has had to battle this unfair and illogical system. She says, for me and for them, I would like to meet the First Minister to find a way to fix this mess. Labour recently set out five clear proposals for reforming the system of access to medicines and submitted it to the government's own review. This included a call for greater transparency in decision making, the ability to negotiate on price, an end to the postcode lottery, the introduction of an interim accepted period and closer working with other parts of the United Kingdom. So will the First Minister today commit to looking at Labour's proposals and to respond to them in detail? I would assume Kezia Dugdale knows that the review being undertaken by Dr Brian Montgomery is underway and hasn't reported yet and proposals whether they come from the Labour Party or from any other quarter will be considered by Dr Montgomery as part of that review. Um, I think there's a very serious issue here and I am, I have to say, slightly disappointed that Kezia Dugdale is choosing to politicise what is an extremely difficult issue. We have, we have systems we have systems in place to make these decisions, these very, very difficult decisions, as fair and as transparent as possible. In the last few years, we have seen significant improvements to these systems. So, for example, the changes we have already introduced uh, have seen a, a tenfold increase in the numbers of medicines being accessed through that individual patient treatment request system. And Dr Brian Montgomery's view, review will bring forward proposals to uh, improve that system even further. But I hope everybody would agree that it is absolutely vital that we have these systems in place because that's how we deliver fairness for patients in an age when new drugs are coming on the market all the time. And it's also how we deliver fairness for taxpayers. If we don't have robust systems in place, then effectively we give drug companies a license to charge whatever they want for the drugs that they bring to market. So these are very, very difficult decisions but we must have the right systems in place to make those decisions. And I would hope that everybody across the, this chamber, uh, no matter the sympathy that we all feel for every patient in a situation like this, would agree with me that it would be entirely wrong for politicians to start to substitute their judgment for the judgment of the people that are trusted to make these decisions, having receipt of all of the information. So we will continue to work to make sure that we have a fair and transparent system in place so that more and more people can get access to the drugs they need and want. The only person that politicised this issue was the First Minister right there on then. The, the truth of the matter, the truth of the matter, First Minister, is that Anne McLean Chang had to find the courage and the strength to tell her story on the front page of a national newspaper for your government to act. Think of all the other people around the country who are waiting for that help. And we know that she is not alone. The system has to be reformed so that in future, cancer patients don't have to hold bake sales to find the money they need for the cancer treatment that they need. So can I ask the First Minister again, when the government's review is published, can she assure the Chamber that cases like Anne's will never happen again? First Minister. No, I, I cannot and I will not uh, give an assurance that no patient will ever again find that they cannot access a drug that they think, uh, in all sincerity, 
they should, because in any system that has to assess drugs, there will inevitably be hard decisions that are difficult for all of us uh, where drugs are not accessible for a particular patient. But I also want to say this is not a case of uh, you know, me and my government intervening. This is a case of the system operating to get a patient the drug that I agree she should be accessing. Now, I go back to the point here. This is about making sure that we have robust systems in place. It would be entirely wrong, and I hope no politician across this chamber is seriously arguing that we should have a system based on whether or not politicians decide to intervene in individual cases. What we have to do is get a system in place that is robust and takes these decisions fairly. We've made improvements. We have vastly increased access to medicines because of the improvements we've already made. And we have got a, a review underway that will report. And if there are recommendations in that review for further improvements, we will not hesitate to make those further improvements. I have a constituency question from Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government condones Police Scotland's decision to push ahead with plans to close eight police stations in Dumfries and Galloway, and more importantly, um, whether she can give any guarantees that she will intervene uh, to save those stations and protect rural police stations right across Scotland. First Minister. Well, of course, this is a, a consultation that will take place, is ongoing, and I'm sure uh, Police Scotland would be very happy to meet with the member to discuss uh, his local concerns. That is absolutely the right and proper way to go about it. Question number three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to people of Scotland. When yeah. I questioned the First Minister in March last year about problems in Police Scotland control rooms, she said, where for any reason service falls short, we will ensure that action is taken to rectify that. Why hasn't she done that? First Minister. Uh, we will uh, take action to rectify any failures uh, where they are brought to our attention. Uh, Michael Matheson has made statements in this Parliament reflecting on the changes that we are making and lessons that are being learned uh, from uh, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary reports. That will continue to be the approach we take. And if there are issues Willie Rennie uh, wants to raise, either here in the chamber uh, or directly with me or with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, then he, of course, is perfectly entitled to do that. Willie Rennie. I'm very surprised that she doesn't know about this. Today we've seen figures that 78,000 calls to the police were dropped. That's calls to the National 101 police number. That's an appalling figure. Callum Steele, he knew about it. He said from the Police Federation that is simply unforgivable and that there are significant challenges in many parts of the service. Sickness rates are high. Morale is low. The I6 IT system has been abandoned. We've just heard about police stations being shut in Dumfries and Galloway. Now we discover that 78,000 calls to the police were dropped. Will the First Minister not look again at the damage that she is doing to the people and to the services that we all rely on? First Minister. Well, I'm sure uh, Willie Rennie, uh, now that he's told me what particular issue it is he wants to raise, will also know uh, that Police Scotland uh, have said that it is entirely misleading and inaccurate to suggest that in excess of 77,000 uh, non-emergency calls are unanswered uh, by Police Scotland. He'll also uh, be aware that police call handlers respond to over 2.5 uh, million uh, 101 calls and around half a million emergency calls every year uh, and Police Scotland report that the average waiting time for a non-emergency 101 call is 12 seconds. Uh, we will always work with the police to improve uh, service levels just as we work with our other public services to make sure uh, that the quality of service uh, to the, the public is high and improving but I would remind uh, Willie Rennie of course that this is the government that has protected a thousand extra police officers on the street which is part of the reason, not the whole reason, but part of the reason why crime is at a 41-year low across this country. A supplementary from Graeme Simpson. <clears throat> Yesterday, the Scottish Government announced it was not accepting in full the recommendations from the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland for next year's council elections. 
The reason we have boundary commissions is that they're independent of political parties. So rejecting their recommendations in five council areas, whatever your view of those boundaries, leaves a nasty stench in the air. This, this unprecedented decision was taken by Joe Fitzpatrick, whose own constituency is in a council area which he has decided not to alter. Can the First Minister explain the decision and what can she say to convince Parliament that Mr Fitzpatrick should not earn the nickname Gerrymandering Joe? First Minister. Um. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure if the member is aware what the Tory government in, in Westminster is doing around boundaries uh, right at the present time. He should perhaps have checked it out before asking his question. Look, we have listened, listened carefully to the concerns of local communities before taking these decisions. The decisions deliver the commitment we made to protect local communities by taking forward changes only where communities have been adequately respected. Uh, and the decisions not to implement some of the changes have cross-party support, including, I have to say, from every member of Dundee City Council. Opposition spokespeople who uh, are, are too uh, quick to attack our decisions seem unaware that their own parties lobbied locally for the changes not to go ahead. So, not only is the member unaware what uh, his Westminster colleagues are doing, he seems blissfully unaware of what his colleagues locally are doing and saying as well. Supplementary from Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister may remember that in February this year, I raised with her the impact of the UK Government's planned reductions to housing benefits for vulnerable people who say in supported and women's age refuge accommodation highlighting the worry and distress caused by these plans. Can I therefore ask if the First Minister, like me, welcomes the news this morning that the UK Government is abandoning these proposals? First Minister. Uh, yes, I am extremely relieved at this U-turn from the UK Government. I think it's ridiculous that there has been so much worry and distress caused to people while the UK Government has dithered over making this decision and I would want to take this opportunity to commend the work of Scottish Women's Aid and others who have campaigned on this issue. Uh, the announcement today offers welcome assurance that funding for the sector will be maintained at current levels and that refugees are no longer at risk of closure as a result of this proposal. Uh, I think we should all welcome that but I think we should all regret that this issue was ever raised in the first place. Supplementary from Daniel Johnson. Presiding officer, uh, last week I held a GP summit for local GPs from Edinburgh Southern and health board officials. It revealed that half of the capital's surgeries could soon be refusing new patients, something which is already true for South, South Edinburgh. Will the First Minister or her health secretary arrange to meet with me, local GPs and NHS Lothian to look at the steps that could be taken to, in their words, about this deepening crisis? First well, I would be happy to ask the Health Secretary to meet with the member. Uh, as the member will be aware, we are investing to increase uh, primary care capacity. For example, we've uh, increased uh, the numbers of uh, posts for GP trainees that are being advertised, and as I said in the Chamber uh, last week, already at this stage in uh, this recruitment round, we're ahead of where we were last year at the end of the recruitment round. There's also uh, a range of investments being made to improve recruitment and retention of GPs, and of course, to make sure that we are helping helping GPs deal with the workload they face through uh, new community link workers, for example, pharmacists and GP practices, new paramedics. So there is a strong programme of work being taken forward by the Health Secretary working with GPs. Of course, we'll have a new contract in place from next year as well uh, to deal with the demands on our GPs who do such a wonderful job for all of us. Uh, and I'm sure the Health Secretary would be delighted to meet with the member to discuss that in more detail. Take a supplementary from Linda Fabiani. <clears throat> Uh, to ask the First Minister for her reaction to the announcement by the UK Home Office that they plan to close the Dungavel Immigration Removal Centre next year, and whether she, along with many, many other concerned people right across the country, will renew calls upon the UK Government for more humane treatment of asylum seekers based in Scotland. First Minister. <laughs> well, I, I 
welcome the announcement that Dungavel is to close. Uh, I and many members across this chamber have campaigned for the closure of Dungavel for very many years, so that is a positive development. I have to say I do have significant concerns about the alternatives to Dungavel that the UK Government uh, announced last week, and we want to engage uh, with the UK Government to see if we can satisfy our concerns on that. Uh, what I think all of us would want to see is a system that replaces Dungavel that is more humane uh, than it, not one that is less humane than it. Uh, I think the uh, UK Government should uh, think less about building walls to keep vulnerable people out and more about how we collectively uh, support the most vulnerable people in our world and give them the support that they so badly need. Question number four, Angus Macdonald. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government will seek to make land ownership transparent. First Minister. Well, we are committed to improving the transparency of land ownership. Uh, work by Registers of Scotland to complete the land register is underway. Uh, with all public land being registered by 2019 and all land by 2024. In addition, the consultation on our proposals for a register of controlling interest in those who own land was published on the 11th of September and will help to inform the regulations that we bring forward next year. Uh, these regulations will help communities, landowners, tenants and the wider public to know and understand more about decision making and land in Scotland. Angus Macdonald. I thank the First Minister for a reply. Does the First Minister agree this is a highly technical and complex area and that improving transparency of ownership is no easy task? Now, there's no doubt there are powerful individuals who would like to see us fail, despite the clearly stated will of this Parliament. In light of that, does the First Minister also welcome, as I do, that the relevant sections of our Land Reform Act received cross-party support in this chamber? First Minister. I do agree that this is a highly complex issue and the consultation that I mentioned a moment ago will inform the detailed work that we need to do to develop robust and workable proposals. Uh, and yes, despite Tory opposition to the Land Reform Act, our amendments lodged at stage three uh, of the bill were supported by all parties in this cham uh, chamber. Uh, and this is very much an area where I think there is considerable consensus across the chamber. And I hope that will continue as we take the next steps in shaping our regulations, uh, regulations that will help to further improve the transparency of land ownership in Scotland. Edward Mountain. I, re I refer members to my register of interest where I've, <laughs> where I've openly and honestly declared my land and I have no fear in doing so. Yeah. I, I wonder if the First Minister would care to accept an invitation from me to walk with me in the Highlands. We could then look and talk about the real land issues which roll, revolve around effective and sustainable as well as productive management rather than, well, li listen, rather than worrying excessively about who owns what. First Minister. <laughs> Presiding officer, I, I would also like to refer people to Edward Mountain's register <laughs> of interest. <laughs> I think it may explain rather a lot. Um, while I uh, would normally uh, take up almost anybody's offer of a walk in the Highlands, <laughs> I think if I can use the, the usual terminology, I think due to considerable diary pressures, I may just have to decline for the moment. David Stewart. Right enough, sir. Does the First Minister share my view that the holy grail of land reform must be an open and transparent land register? And does the First Minister agree with my analysis that that means no front companies, no shoddy shell PLCs and no multinational tax havens registered in Panama? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with uh, the sentiment behind that question, which is why we're putting so much emphasis on transparency. I, uh, refer the member to my initial answer when I talked about the work to complete the land register and also the regulations that will introduce a register of controlling interests. And of course, uh, one of the, the reasons why we want to do that is to reduce the scope for the kind of uh, revelations that we saw uh, exposed in the Panama Papers scandal, for example. So we'll do as much as we can to make sure that our system of land ownership in Scotland and the details of land ownership in Scotland are as transparent as possible. I would say to the member, though, that some of of uh, the changes that he may like to see here are reserved to uh, the Westminster government. So I hope he will join with us in seeking uh, the powers we need uh, to do everything that I think he would like to see us do. 
Question number five, Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Faculty of Advocates' reported concerns that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is under-resourced. First Minister. The Finance Secretary will continue to discuss uh, the budget for the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service with the Lord Advocate as the spending review process uh, develops. Uh, the Scottish Government has provided the service with extra funding of £4.7 million over the last two years to allow it to investigate and prosecute three exceptionally complex cases. In addition, we're also providing uh, just under £3 million over three years for the prosecution of domestic abuse cases as part of the extra £20 million across the justice sector to tackle abuse against women and girls. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service continues to meet all of its operational targets uh, and, of course, the Lord Advocate was previously the Dean of the Faculty Faculty of Advocates himself, uh, and I know that he is uh, proud to lead the service and will continue the work to make sure that it delivers uh, for all of uh, the people of Scotland in terms of the quality of service it provides. Douglas Ross. First Minister for that response. Brian McConaughey QC, a former senior prosecutor at the Crown Office, has claimed that the Scottish Government cuts to the justice system have left the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service under resource, saying, if you're going to continually do that, then what you end up with is a substandard justice system. Now, the First Minister rightly mentioned the additional funding for domestic abuse, and as members prepare to debate the Scottish Government's proposals to introduce a domestic abuse law this afternoon, can the First Minister provide assurances that the Crown Office is sufficiently resourced to handle the increasing demands placed on it to ensure that the victims really do receive the, receive the justice they deserve? First Minister. Well, I think it's important to point out the, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service budget hasn't uh, been cut. The budget has remained static over the past five years with additional funding provided for the three complex cases I spoke about and also to improve the time taken to prosecute domestic abuse. Uh, so we will continue uh, to discuss with the Lord Advocate, uh, principally the Finance Secretary will do that to make sure that the Crown Office uh, does have the resources it needs to prosecute uh, crime and to meet the targets that I said earlier on and will repeat now, it continues to meet. Uh, it's an extremely high performing public service as the public have a right to expect it to be and we will continue to make sure that it has the resources to continue to provide that high quality of service. Question number six, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the UK Climate Committee's Reducing Emissions in Scotland 2016 Progress Report. First Minister. Well, we welcome this new progress report uh, from the Committee on Climate Change. Uh, Rosanna Cunningham and I were delighted to meet with Lord Debin, the chair of the committee, shortly after its launch on Tuesday. Uh, in the report, the committee recognises that Scotland continues to lead the UK in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and it highlighted the excellent progress we've made to date, including having exceeded the level of our 2020 target six years early. Uh, we are considering the committee's report and we will respond in due course. Uh, our new climate change plan, which will be published in draft this winter, will set out our priorities and commitments for delivering emissions reductions under the 2009 Act. And of course, we'll also work with the committee to prepare a new climate change bill uh, with proposals to be outlined in early 2017. Claudia Beamish. I thank the First Minister for that answer. As she will know, many of the technologies needed as we shift towards a low carbon future are in their infancy or indeed don't yet exist. What assessment has the Scottish Government done of the state of research funding and commercialisation of support for new technologies in the heaviest G greenhouse gas emitting sectors, transport, energy, housing and agriculture, and the synergies between these? And what reassurances can she give today to the Chamber that, that essential research funding will be available from her government? First Minister. Well, Rosanna Cunningham, the uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, for the Environment, has just met research providers. We uh, undertake assessments uh, across all of these areas. I'll ask uh, Rosanna Cunningham to write to the member with more detail about uh, the state of assessment in terms of the new technologies and the research that we require to do. The member makes uh, two points that I think uh, merit underlining. First is the importance of new and emerging technologies. And uh, Monday of this week, I was up in NIG uh, launching the first phase of the major and tidal stream power project. Uh, a project that when it is fully installed will have the uh, capacity 
to power the equivalent of almost 200,000 homes across Scotland. Now, I mention that today because, of course, the UK government has just given the go-ahead to Hinkley Point, a, a decision that I think is wrong. But the point I'm making is that right now, uh, the UK government continues to dither on a contract for difference that would allow Maygen to move into its second phase. I hope they take a decision on that and that it's a positive decision uh, very quickly. The second point, very briefly, that the member makes, which I think uh, should be underlined, is the importance of us now uh, upping our action in areas like transport, housing and agriculture. I think everybody, even our uh, critics would accept that we have uh, seen considerable success, there's still work to do when it comes to electricity generation in terms of reducing emissions, uh, but we must now go into areas which will be much harder, uh, agriculture, transport, uh, the energy sector more generally. Uh, but if we are serious as we are about not just meeting and continuing to meet our current targets, uh, but meeting the more ambitious targets we intend to set in the new Act, that's what we need to do. And I hope that when we do put forward the proposals to achieve that, we will have support from right across the Chamber. Mark Roskill. Thank you. Um, First Minister, the UK Climate Change Committee this week highlighted once again that emissions from transport are holding us back and that there are zero actions, zero actions in your government's climate action plan to address this. Isn't it time for some big, bold ideas? Does the First Minister agree with me that in order to help cut road casualties, protect the vulnerable and make our communities healthier, low-carbon places to live, we should be saying 20 is plenty on all of Scotland's residential roads. First Minister. Well, we would certainly encourage local authorities to consider that where uh, that is appropriate. I mean, let, let me firstly agree with the member, and I, I think it's what I've just said. We've had considerable success. It's not been easy success to achieve, but in the, the, the area of climate change and reducing emissions, uh, the further we raise our ambition, the tougher it gets to take the action and the more controversial some of the actions become and that's where consensus and support around this chamber is going to be so important and there is no doubt that transport uh, you know, partly because it impacts directly on the lives of many people falls into that much more controversial uh, area but if we're going to continue to meet our ambitious targets and, and see them stretched even further than we're going to have to do that. Uh, the, the final com comment I would make though is I think uh, the member who you know has uh, real credibility on this issue and I don't argue uh, that for a, a second. You know the climate change report this week it lauded Scotland as a, a leader. It, it lauded us for having met our target uh, ahead of schedule. Yes it said we had much more to do uh, but I do think we should concentrate on the positive uh, as well as uh, pressure the government and rightly challenge the government to go further and I would hope we would get some uh, positive endorsement from uh, the Green members of, of the Chamber for the progress, often with their help, we have managed to make so far. Morris Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The report makes clear that emissions from heavy good vehicles account for 17% of Scotland's transport emissions, but the Scottish Government has achieved no overall change in emissions in that sector between 2009 and 2014. Will the First Minister consider promoting urban consolidation centres, uh, logistical hubs which reduce freight journeys, in order to reduce emissions from the transport sector and also link this to a transport sector specific climate change target? First Minister. Well, I would be uh, very happy, as I'm sure she will be, for, uh, to ask the, the, the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment to meet with the member to discuss. Uh, that and other suggestions. Uh, as, we, as we continue to make sure we've got the plans in place to meet the current target, but also uh, extend that target, as I've said, we are going to have to consider uh, proposals in, in the nature of the one that the, the member has just put forward to make sure we're able to do that. So the more uh, cross-party consensus we can build on this across the chamber, the more uh, chance we have of being successful. So Rosanna Cunningham will be happy to meet to talk about that suggestion in more depth. Question uh, seven. <laughs> Question 7, Kate Forbes. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government will achieve 100% broadband rollout across Scotland. First Minister. Uh, well, as I announced in the programme for government, we uh, intend to provide 100% broadband coverage uh, to both domestic and commercial premises across Scotland and uh, to do that we will launch procurement activity in 2017. Uh, as a first step we've already published a prior information notice, we did that on the 9th of September, which launches a formal supplier engagement exercise to help inform our delivery plan and this activity builds on the £400 million of investment to deliver broadband coverage to at least 95% of premises by the end of next year and as a result of our investment approximately 640,000 premises in Scotland had access to 
to fibre broadband at the end of August this year. Kate Forbes. I thank the First Minister for her reply. In my rural constituency of Skye, Le Chabre and Badenoch, there are still significant gaps in mobile reception. How does the Scottish Government intend to enhance mobile coverage where the UK Government has failed to do so? First Minister. Uh, well, this is an important question for everybody living in a, a rural part of Scotland. Uh, mobile connectivity is, of course, largely a reserved matter, but notwithstanding that, we have been determined to take action where we can to improve uh, mobile coverage across the country. Our mobile action plan shows very clearly our commitment to work with the industry to improve mobile coverage across Scotland, particularly in rural areas. Uh, and the fact that we're the only part of the UK to have such a plan in place, uh, I hope demonstrates clearly the approach we are taking, as does our willingness to work with the industry and providers to address the need to infill mobile coverage in remote areas. So this is a key priority for us as we continue to take forward our work on broadband coverage and the Cabinet Secretary uh, for the Rural Economy and Connectivity would be uh, happy to meet with Kate Forbes to discuss our progress in more detail. Jamie Green. Uh, does the First Minister accept that uh, current access to broadband is far from adequate for many across Scotland and will she heed Audit Scotland's advice that recommends that we should publish more information on the performance of the programme, in particular data on speed and coverage? Well, we have uh, already increased uh, access to next generation broadband. As I said, uh, we are on track to deliver our commitment to 95% coverage uh, by the end of uh, next year. And the commitment we've given to 100% coverage by the end of this parliament is one that I don't believe has been given uh, yet by other uh, governments across uh, the UK. So we are serious about ensuring uh, that this commitment is there for everybody, not just uh, for some. I said last week, and I think it's true, uh, that these days uh, broadband coverage and, and digital connectivity is as fundamental to how you live your life or run a business as electricity or running water is. That's how important it is. Uh, obviously, there is uh, information published about the performance of uh, the project. I'm happy to, to look and consider whether there's more information we can publish about the progress uh, of that commitment. But the commitment uh, that we have already made uh, is being met. We're on track to meet our commitment for the end of next year, and we're absolutely determined that we'll meet our 100% commitment by the end of this parliament. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister why the commitment in the SNP manifesto just five months ago of 100% broadband by 2020 has already slipped to 2021? First Minister. So the commitment is by the end of the Parliament. The commitment is as the commitment has always been. And it's a commitment I've just reiterated, I think, on more than one occasion here today, as I did in the programme for government last week. By the end of this Parliament, we intend that there will be next generation broadband access for 100% of commercial and residential premises across uh, the country. Uh, I can't remember if that was a commitment in the Labour Party manifesto, but I know it was a commitment in the SNP manifesto, and I'm determined that we're going to deliver it. And that concludes, that concludes First Minister's questions. We'll now move to members' business. In the name of Jeremy Balfour, and I will allow a few moments just to change seats.